so I think the, the fundamental problem is you have one side, China, the Chinese Communist Party, that considers itself at war with the West, and then you have the West thinking we're just doing business. That's a huge disconnect. Right, and, and, and of course, at war has certain connotations in the West that absolutely don't resonate in China. At war means that um, my ideology is better than yours, and therefore I'm going to use the, the political system, the global political system, and your own political system to ensure that my ideology is the one that, that reigns dominant. You know, when I think of war, you know, what I was taught, you know, is, you know, for the most part, we're at peace at all times uh, until something happens where the government needs to, you know, um, coerce, uh, you know, another nation state to do something. And then, you know, we send the military to use military force to achieve a political outcome. That is that is the, the, the Western notion of war. In China, the notion of war is we're always at war. And we're always at war because the Chinese Communist Party is always a threat from the, the principles of Western liberal democracy. And as long as those are allowed to survive, then they become a threat uh, to the Chinese Communist Party because the the, the potential always could be that somehow a spark uh, happens in China that would allow those those uh, those principles of Western liberal democracies to to come into favor and that therefore it could lead to the overthrow of the Chinese Communist Party. So you have to suppress that. And the global narrative, the global ideological narrative has to support this idea that, you know, um, you know, non-interference in countries and you know, the, you know, the, this idea that the sovereign, you know, the, 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 the people exist for the sovereign, not the other way around. So at the beginning of the podcast, I asked you what steps the U.S. can take to win this new Cold War. It sounds like the U.S. is not taking those steps. No, they're not. And, you know, um, the uh, what we saw in the Trump administration was we had a great strategy. Uh, the strategy and was, for the most part, adopted by the Biden administration. But the implementation of that strategy is what suffers. So in the in, in the Trump administration, you had uh, at the White House, you had the National Security Council you had the National Economic Council. Um, the National Security Council recognized the implications of our rela economic relationship with China and re re understood they were a threat. The National Economic Council said, no, we need to do business with China. Then you had on the at the cab at the cabinet level, you had the Department of Defense and the Department of State saying, "Hey, this is a threat." And then you had the, the Department of Commerce and the Department of Treasury saying, "No, we need to continue to do business with them." Um, there was a constant war, and Mnuchin was basically uh, had the power to uh, push off the State Department and DoD and to continue uh, these relationships with China. And what's happened is you had the same battle. You can see the same battle has been happening in the Biden administration. They were far more tough on China in the very beginning. Um, basically, six months ago, that battle was won by the, the Treasury and Commerce Departments. And now it's back full on. You know, we need to do business with China. We need to recognize they're a threat. So let's try to craft this, you know, um, you know very sophisticated way of you know, not enabling their military uh, development. You know, we they, they shouldn't use chips and AI to develop their military. That's not our problem. You know, our problem is they're using those relationships with those companies to subvert our own social, cultural, and political system. And that's the part that we need to get after. Yeah, about, about a year ago, the Biden administration finally announced its uh, official China policy. And I knew something was already up there because it was this weird, it was kind of bipolar. It, like half of it was like, you know, the Chinese Communist Party is committing genocide. It's a threat. It's all of these things. But we have to work with them. And that's such a weird conclusion to come to after everything else that was said. And now we've can, seen how. Can you imagine the same thing being said about Hitler? Oh, yeah. you know, he's a genocidal maniac, but we got to work with him. What? Well, but I think, I think it's historically, it's, it's helpful to understand that even in the United States, there was some substantial amount of support for Hitler uh, in the 30s. Uh, there, were, there were people who, who liked the Nazi ideology and who had you know, clubs and societies in the U.S. that were in favor of that. And, and uh, U.S. businesses were you know, doing business with, with Nazi Germany. IBM, of course, famously helped with the punch cards that, that helped the Nazis keep track of uh, all the Jews they wanted to exterminate. But also you had... Hollywood 
uh, censoring movies uh, so they could get into the German market uh, up until the U.S. got into the war. So there was, I do see some parallels with that. Well, but also think about this. We had the opportunity for a war, and it's tragic to say, we had the opportunity for a war to sever those relationships, right? Because overnight, those relationships were, for the most part, severed. What, what, so one of the downfalls, I guess, of the nuclear age is that it's not going to it's not going to allow for a war between the U.S. and China because it would be too devastating. So that means that there's nothing that will really cause that economic and political and social uh, and cultural cut. And therefore, we continue to have a slow erosion uh, of our um, of our way of life and our way of government. And I think that's the thing. That's the um that's the insight that the two PLA uh, lieutenant colonels, when they wrote Unrestricted Warfare, had had really uh, captured is this is that there is a different way to think about this competition with the West and this ideological competition. And that is if there is no chance for a real true military conflict between these two sides, well, then they have no real reason to disentangle. Right. There's nothing that causes that automatic break like war. And there's really nothing like that for causing that automatic break. Now, look at what ha what's happened with um, with with Putin and his invasion of Ukraine. I mean, for the most part, what you see is the West is paying for Ukraine and paying for Russia through its you know relationships with you know China. So um, we're basically funding both sides of the war and providing resources to both sides of the war because we are economically intertwined, and that's the outcome of that uh, of that intertwinement. And so. You know, this is the concept that the Chinese Communist Party leadership understands that is that there's nothing going to cause that break. And so as long as we don't have that break. And by the way, this is why Xi Jinping says, well, we don't we shouldn't have cold, a Cold War mentality. You know, we did have that break. But, you know, in essence, I think what caused that was um, was somebody like Churchill coming to the United States and saying, you know, we have to fight this evil and, and recognition, you know, uh, across the Atlantic that we must work together to fight this evil. Now you look at it, we're completely fractured um, as Western democracies in terms of our approach to China. Uh, you have Macron going over there and, and singing Xi Jinping's uh, praises. So we are the Chinese Communist Party have found themselves in a peculiar, peculiar pace place in history where the nuclear weapons are, are, are going to ensure that no war happens that would cause a clean cut. And then there's no um, statesman of any stature that's willing to stand up and say, we have to do this.